All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Justin Keller. I'm the Associate Director of Marketing here at Visage Mobile. Um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Chris Silva, who is the analyst for uh, enterprise and brand-facing mobile with Altimeter Group. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and we're looking forward to a really, really fantastic webinar this morning. Chris? Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Justin, and thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited to share with you some of the ideas that have uh, come about through Altimeter's research into how enterprises are embracing the disruption that is mobility and how uh, building a platform for that mobility can actually help enterprises realize even greater gains than they've realized to date. A couple items before we get started. Uh, for those of you who have been paying attention today, uh, it seems we're potentially the only game in town with Google I am down and Twitter down for many folks. Uh, we hope that uh, both of those services come back up, and when the latter does, we have a hashtag. It's pound sign or hash mobile 2.0. Pound sign or hash mobile 2.0 is our hashtag today. Again, for those of you who can use Twitter, we're all, we're all jealous of you and hoping that you'll participate in the dialogue. Secondly, we have a question Q&A uh, facility in your GoToMeeting player. Feel free to use that. Uh, and we'll be queuing up questions throughout. We've got a couple polls today as well, and we'll be uh, introducing those as we go through today's content. So Q&A in the sidebar, polls forthcoming, and our hashtag mobile 2.0. So let's dive in. Really, the, the topics I'd like to cover today, number one, uh, what are we going to look at? What are the questions we're going to answer? I'll then talk through uh, how we see mobile taking shape today, how mobile is taking shape in the enterprise, and how that ripple from the consumer adoption of enterprises is taking shape, and how do we as organizations that are looking to embrace mobile, looking to control mobile, or simply looking to respond to mobile, how do we choose the right path of action in order to make mobile a value add for our employees and for our organizations as a whole? So first off, what are we here to, to accomplish? Uh, we're really looking to answer the questions, what are the elements of mobile control and, and the mobile control plane as we call it? We'll talk about what that is. What are they and how do they interoperate? What are policies and leadership? What are the soft skills that take place or need to take shape inside of an organization in order to create a successful organizational-wide mobile strategy? And lastly, how do you go about building this platform? We're talking about how mobile is taking shape, how organizations are responding, or in some cases not responding. We also want to talk about the next steps to build a proper foundation for mobility. And I think you'll find today that it has some elements that you know it also has some elements that you perhaps haven't anticipated or that you didn't expect. So let's talk a little bit about where we are in mobile. We all know that this is an extremely uh, vibrant area of interest among consumers. We know it's a vibrant interest area for employees. But let's start to quantify exactly what this tidal wave looks like. First of all, one of the things I like to look at as far as interest in mobile comes down to where we've seen investment. So we look at, in our research at Altimeter uh, at the different investments being made by the venture capital community. $6.3 billion from uh, uh, venture capitalists as of January 2012, or 42% of their budgets, almost half of their budgets, were made in mobile technology investments in 2011. This is up from $4.5 billion in 2010. So what's interesting here is the dollars are following interest, the dollars are following technology. We've seen a huge sea change in what mobility means and what it's possible to, to accomplish with mobile in just a few short years. And keep in mind that 2010 to 2012 time frame is where we'll be referencing a lot today. That's really where we've seen uh, amazing growth and a lot of the disruption that is causing us all today to try and figure out how do we harness it, how do we respond to it. When you think about mobile marketing and advertising, companies spending $592 million in 2011, that's almost a five-fold increase from $128 million the year before. So this is investment from the VC community, trying to fund organizations, startups, technology organizations that are getting into mobile, making mobile more effective. But we're also seeing massive investments from the brands and the products that we, we interact with daily as consumers. On both sides, at work and at home, we're being bombarded with mobile opportunity. And it is opportunity and not distraction. It is opportunity and not necessarily uh, detriment for us because it is bringing new things to bear that we can do and that we can experience that were never possible before. All goodness. And what's really interesting when you think about mobile and how it's grown is when you compare it to the economy, when you compare it to the social mores and the, the 
general attitudes of the population. We see mobile as a recession-proof technology. We see mobile as something that's grown at a steady rate and in some cases at an exponential rate when other indicators are pointing to flat or even negative growth. Smartphones have been largely recession resistant, growing from 25% penetration in that 2010 time frame to over 50% penetration. And that's according to Nielsen. If you look at the Nielsen numbers, we've actually crossed the 50% threshold in terms of the percentage of U.S. consumers who own a mobile phone having a smartphone. And this actually counters other uh, confidence indicators. So if you look at Gallup, and, and they make a lot of their data uh, available freely, and you look at things like the economic confidence indicators, you look at the general happiness indicator, which is something that they quantify, and you look at it between that October 2010 time frame and the uh, July 2012 time frame, all of those numbers were either flat, had dipped down to a low, uh, and were nowhere near the, the high on average in that time frame. Uh, many of the values at the end of this time period, so in the recent past month or two, are at or close to their lowest number. So people don't have economic confidence. The general consensus on where the economy is going is still not nearly the rosy picture it, it should be, or even the, the, the uh, middle of the road picture it should be. And uh, our overall investment has been extremely conservative, yet we're still as consumers going out and picking up two, three, four, five hundred dollar mobile devices because they change the way we live our lives. Smart di device usage itself is, is showing where this investment is taking shape. And we're in still early days now when you look at the um, percentage of browsing that's taking place from a uh, mobile device. And you look at uh, the US, you look in Europe, we're at about anywhere from 5 to about 8%. If you look in emerging markets, we're seeing 15 almost 18% with massive uh, increases in growth in these markets in users almost leapfrogging the desktop experience in many cases and gravitating to mobile as their screen of choice. So these numbers may look small today, especially in the first world nations and in North America where many of us are located, but the number to look at is the growth. And if you look at the growth in emerging, uh, emerging markets, like the 192.5% uptick since 2010 in Asia, this is where we're going. We may be moving at a slightly slower pace. There was an existing uh, baseline of technology in place that uh, is being displaced by mobile, but uh, we've seen the average smartphone usage. It's nearly tripled in 2011. Uh, web traffic itself is up 162%. So we're accessing information in new and different ways, we're doing it on the go. Uh, only 12% of the global handset markets that are out there today are smartphones, but it's only over 82% of the total global handset traffic. As we start seeing markets turn on, the general push for the pace of technology, those investments that we referenced at the front will only ramp up and that will manifest itself in more choices for users and more uh, choices to deal with on the part of the enterprise. 500 million smartphones shipped in 2011 alone and we're seeing 2012 off to an even more uh, rapid and robust start. Uh, 145 million devices, uh, so getting close to a quarter of that 500 million devices from 2011. That happened in just the first quarter of 2010, uh, and that's up from 101 million in the same period last year. So we're seeing almost a 1.5 percent delta between year-on-year -year time periods in how interested consumers are to get their hands on this technology. Uh, total shipments for the end of last year, by some estimates, uh, almost 500 million units, and again, up 61 percent from 2010. Uh, it's just uh, amazing to see how many dollars and how much consumer interest is being poured into smartphones. And the picture is relatively static in first world nations here in North America when we think about smartphones, we think about Android devices, we think about iOS devices, and many of us in the enterprise sector think about Blackberry devices. Uh, and this is some data from Nielsen that looks at where we're at as of June 2012. So all smartphone owners on the left, uh, Android making up a huge share of the smartphone population today, uh, iOS number two, uh, RIM number three, and then others in the, the number four spot. And that's Windows Phone, that's Symbian, uh, that is uh, the remainder of the Palm OS devices that are out there. When you look to the right-hand side, this is people who acquired a smartphone in the past three months. So those buyers that pushed us over that 50% mark, that ditched the feature phone or ditched the flip phone or the old Nokia that they had hanging around, and move to a smartphone. 
and the overwhelming choice, again, is Android. And I point that out because Android itself, as many of us know, is a very fragmented ecosystem. The most recent version of the Android operating system, Jelly Bean or 4.1, that was released officially just in the last month, makes up a small portion of the overall Android ecosystem. And we see a great deal of devices running Android uh, version 2.3, which is gingerbread, uh, and a multitude of other versions in between. So when we talk about smartphones, number one, calling all smartphones equal is certainly not the case based on the operating systems that we see in place and looking at even the largest chunk, that biggest contiguous chunk of smartphone uh, devices as Android devices doesn't tell us a whole lot more because there's so much difference in terms of what an Android device is and what that means for users today. So I actually want to pause here and I want to put this to the audience and get a sense for you, from you rather, uh, what is the uh, device footprint look like inside of your organization? Uh, so we've got a poll, and we're uh, looking to get a little bit of input from you all around the platforms that are supported inside of your organization. So there may be many platforms existing inside of your organization, but we're looking to get uh, a sense of what it is that's supported today. So we'll push that poll, and uh, let's see. Give it a couple seconds to percolate here, and you know there there may be uh, different ways to look at this. You you may not actually be sure, and that's fine as well. We're really just trying to get a sense of what the uh, gamut is uh, across which we're represented today. And uh, Justin, if you can just give me a heads up when the poll is populated, I'm actually not going to see results on my end. So we're basically asking you to say, look, we've got zero devices or, or, or one type of device that we support, two to three. Uh, perhaps you've got more than three. Uh, perhaps you've thrown the doors open and there's no official, quote unquote, official designation for mobile OS. All are welcome. Uh, or perhaps you don't know. So give it a couple seconds. Give your best guess. We're interested to hear what you have to say. and We'll be sharing this data uh, with everybody in just a minute. Okay, it looks like most people have voted. So we're going to go ahead and close this off. Okay. And um, if you want me to read it back, we've got 6% have 0 to 1, 28% have 2 to 3, 28% have more than 3, 22% have no official designation, and the last 17% are not sure. Okay. All right. So it, 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 it's, it's interesting to see that there's, there's a number of devices in play, and thank you, Justin, for the results. Uh, it's uh, very common, very in line with what we're seeing inside of organizations. We pretty much move past in most organizations, in most verticals, the point where uh, one OS has been uh, christened as the only choice for users. We're, we're simply at a point where the, the magnitude of, of user device demand and user device choice has moved us to a multi-OS future. And that adds another layer of complexity for enterprises that are looking to uh, contend with mobile. Uh, so we talked a lot about consumers. We talked about how consumers are uh, looking to buy these devices despite economic indicators saying that they should do otherwise. When we actually look at some data here from uh, Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center uh, and the Internet in American Life Project, something I urge you to take a look at uh, offline if you haven't, really deep, interesting data on uh, all things mobile, all things Internet. Uh, but the biggest concentration of smartphone consumers, the most prolific smartphone consumers, are those that are entering the workforce today or early in the workforce now. So many, many more in the, the number two and number three categories are those that have been in the workforce for a while, those of us in the 30 to 49 category, uh, and the, the, the third place ranking, the 50 to 64 category. But what's really interesting here is this 66% of all adults, 18 to 29, are uh, just, just driving it, bringing these devices with them. And they're not just looking to use them for work tools, they're using them as lifestyle tools. 70% uh, of the college grads, basically, are, are, are taking these devices with them, looking to use these devices when they can. We talked about the, the, the push for devices. We talked about the uh, variance in uh, the different platforms. What's interesting, too, is the variance in devices. Uh, so when we look at devices like the new iPad, we see that businesses are finding use cases for this device, either officially or unofficially, uh, pushing this device out as something 
thing that users can uh, make use of in the field, can make use of in place of a laptop, or can make use of to augment what they do day to day. 21% of all new iPad users are business users versus 13% of previous iPads. And one more note on scale here. Some of you may have seen this statistic or heard this statistic. When the uh, new iPad was launched on Black Friday, so the Friday after the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, big shopping day, people go out to the stores, pick up their electronic devices. Those devices were sold at such a rapid rate that the actual number of devices sold, I believe it was 4 million in that first uh, weekend, was, if stacked, uh, a, a pile that would have measured in miles. So this is just an exponential uh, growth in a, a device and the adoption of a device that didn't even exist two or three years ago. Uh, last bit on, on, on adoption here is to contrast what we've seen in terms of mobile usage and every other recent technology that has been a game changer. So this is some data from Morgan Stanley Research uh, that compares mobile internet uh, of the NTT Docomo or iMode or WAP devices, desktop internet with the launch of uh, the Netscape browser in December of 1994, and desktop internet with the launch of the AOL service in September of 94. All of these massive game changers, largely when you compare them to a, a, an even curve hockey stick graphics of growth. And when you look at just two devices, the iPhone and iPod Touch, when they launched in uh, June of 2007, the growth rate of these devices simply dwarfs any other mobile or uh, uh, internet connected technology that we've seen in the past. So we've crossed this 50% threshold. Consumers have spoken. Uh, they've chosen their devices and they've chosen smartphones. They've chosen tablets. Well, those workers are consumers as well. And that 50% number I think is important because we think about all of the users, all of the buyers across the U.S. that have some sort of mobile device, half of them, and actually a little bit more than half of them, one and two, are carrying smartphones today. When you think about that number and translate it to employees, 50% of employees is actually quite a conservative estimate. You're dealing with higher net worth and, and higher disposable income individuals. You're dealing with a great deal of knowledge workers, uh, in many cases techno technologically savvy users in that uh, 18 to 49 uh, combined age group that is taking these devices on at a much higher rate. One in two is probably the minimum you'd see inside of your organization in terms of users demanding smart devices. So we're past the point, really, of anticipating a mobile rush. The rush is clearly on, and, and I think we're actually well into a second device wave. We're starting to see tablets go beyond just the iPad. We're seeing devices like Google's Nexus 7 sell out in a matter of days, priced at a $199 price point. Uh, we're not only at a point where users are bringing devices into the workplace and demanding support for them, we're seeing users bring multiple OSs and multiple devices into the workplace, and it's our turn to figure out how, to, how we deal with these. Um, obviously, user trends will affect the enterprise, and I, I talk to many organizations, and thankfully fewer and fewer with every passing year that I cover mobile technology, uh, I see fewer and fewer ignoring these devices or simply locking the devices out. Uh, to do so is really at the peril of enterprise data, and we'll talk about why that is, uh, how we see users uh, skirting regulation, as it were, uh, in, in the quest to take their mobile devices over many other things. There's just some data released this week that uh, a large percentage of CEOs said they'd rather give up their daily coffee than give up their smartphone. So pretty integral to the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, workers. Uh, and it's a multifaceted problem. We don't simply uh, want to have you come here today and talk about uh, locking things down or securing data or uh, choosing two, those two or three platforms, as many of you indicated or supported, calling it a day and going home. Uh, there's a complex foundation that needs to be built to properly enable mobility. And enabling mobility itself is a little bit more complex than many organizations uh, think it is. So what do, we, what do we do? What happens when these consumers with their smartphones, their tablets, their uh, Chromebook devices, whatever it happens to be, what do we do when these consumers go to the office? So this is some interesting data around what's actually happening. We know the devices are in the hands of users. Um, this is actually a, a different 50% uh, data point, and I want to point that out. 
but over 50% of users are taking business data onto their personal devices, whether this is email, whether this is using a program like Dropbox or Box, or uh, simply taking information and storing it on the accessible storage on their mobile device. More than half of users today, and actually this is Q3 2011, so the number has likely increased, uh, are taking this device data, uh, this data with them on their devices. Less than 5%, and again, this goes back to the end of 2011, I'm sure the number is actually minuscule today and probably uh, even fractional, but less than 5% of workers at that time worldwide were carrying separate work and personal devices. So this was the uh, age, there was an age here where we had the BlackBerry in one hand and the personal device in the other and the user chose to carry both. 95% of workers have moved on from that model, if not more, because it's simply inconvenient. It leads to use, usage atrophy on the device that the employer is paying for, which is a cost issue, and leads ultimately to the choice of a personally mandated or personally chosen device where data is stored. I think the scariest part of this, though, is this is the end of last year, November 2011, from some data that was gathered by Citrix in the U.S. 70% of firms had no formal policy for this type of use, for this personal data, a personal device with enterprise data on it. So nearly three quarters of the firms that were surveyed said, you know what, there's no way for us to mandate what is done and what is not done with these personal devices carrying enterprise data. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I want to talk a little bit about the fact that as we see these workers become mobile workers and we cross this 50% mark with one in every two employees, if not more, carrying a device, how do we create an environment that allows us to anticipate the needs both now and in the future of these users and meet them in a way that's flexible and dynamic? There's three different roles that we see inside of organizations that are mobile. Your organization or your vertical may have more roles. They may be slightly uh, different roles than these three, but these are the three most common use cases for mobile inside of an organization. And we have the information worker, which most all verticals, most all organizations have. This is a worker that is simply uh, looking to consume information. They've got that tablet or smartphone that they use for shopping, for uh, GPS, for communicating with their uh, friends and their social graph, for email. They're doing all these things and they form these habits. This is the screen they turn to first for access to information. And they're really looking to do the same inside the organization. It's actually a relatively simple problem in the grand scheme of things to solve. It's putting information in the hands of those users in a way that's controlled by the enterprise. But simply making information available in a static way, in a controlled way, doesn't actually solve some of the workers that have more direct impact on the business. So the second role I'd like to talk about is the field or sales worker. Uh, and these are largely mobile employees. This is the traditional road warrior, the sales for person that's in the field with clients all day, the field service tech that's making calls and doing repairs or stocking goods uh, or simply doing inspections in the field. And while having access to information in a static fashion for these workers is great, they need to take it one step further and they really need to collaborate. They need to take photos, videos, uh, samples in the field and put those either on the mobile device or take them through the mobile device to a central data store. They need to be able to share that information with other peers in the field to report on conditions, exchange information, and stay on top of problems because the era of batching information and then uploading it at the end of the day or the end of the, the cycle simply doesn't work. The third group is a bit of a mixed group. It's the executive and the technical worker. So we've all heard the stories of the executive bringing the iPad in and saying, this is what I want, this is what I need to be supported on, figure out how to make it work. And in large part, that is a great way to drag the organization forward into a mobile management uh, mindset. But in many organizations, what we see is that is a reactionary response. Let's support this iPad or let's support this class of users. The other side of this group is the technical worker, the IT folks, the, the, the people that are sysadmins, that are simply not at a desk or a desktop or even a laptop computer to get their jobs done. They need an environment that is portable, that allows the computing experience to follow them wherever they are so they can get their job done and remain productive. So as you can see, just at this very high level with three different personas for mobile, there's simply no way, no one device, no one set of tools that can enable mobility across the entire organization. Mobile is much more nuanced than this and needs to have a platform that can account for the needs of the 
information consumer, the information worker, the collaborator, those in the field, and those that are looking to compute, the executives and the technical workers inside of your organization. Users right now are driving choice. Consumers, as we mentioned, are employees. And a bait and switch approach or a, a forced choice approach is really, uh, in many cases, at the uh, idea of mitigating business risk or business pain, but in the end, it only yields more. Embracing mobile, it goes far beyond basic email. It goes far beyond simply managing the device. It's an important foundational aspect of what mobile productivity is, but each role can thrive if you up the ante and give them those tools that can empower them in the day-to-day -day tasks that they need to get their jobs done and done well. Command, control, and limitation, it really does breed a bit of a hacker culture. Uh, we've talked to many, many organizations in the research that we've recently conducted around building mobile applications and sourcing mobile applications for these different roles where the organization was caught off guard, compliant subject data sitting in Dropbox, which uh, it seems every couple of quarters we hear about some data breaches in, in them or another cloud-based service. Uh, no visibility into what is being used, what is being charged back to the organization, and overall a lack of knowledge and ability to be proactive on the part of management, HR, legal, and IT when a culture of command and control is taken on. Great. So how do I build this truly dynamic mobile policy, this panacea for mobile? How do I take it on? How do I do it in a way that can scale with my organization, that doesn't break the bank, and that does so in a way that keeps all of the different camps from the executives to the legal and HR, risk and compliance, and IT, and of course, last but most importantly, users happy. The expectation of mobility in the workplace increases every, every day. Simply allowing the devices, simply allowing email, simply allowing off-the-shelf applications are responses that very quickly run out of road. The market right now is rife with solutions. It's nearly impossible to pick a winner among the mobile device management, mobile application management, mobile insert vowel here management tools that are in the market. And I'll talk a little bit about where this market's going and how we seeing it, see it getting even a bit more crowded. But that does not mean that now is not the time to make a decision. Now is the time to weigh the options and figure out how to take on a flexible and, react and, and, and proactive control infrastructure. I want to share some data that IBM gathered earlier this year. They have, for the last, I think, nine years, been conducting a global CEO study. And they get some really high-level folks at the table. And they basically ask them what their issues are. How do they run their businesses? How do they do what they do better and more effectively? What they found was a third, so 33% of the underperforming global firms, and they segmented firms into underperformers and overperformers to figure out, well, what are the characteristics of underperforming firms versus overperforming firms? One third, and this is the biggest sort of group uh, that, that preferred this type of interaction, one third of these firms preferred operational control, the traditional command and control way of thinking where the organization is in control, it sets the tone, and the uh, employees follow. That right there is a symptom of organizations that are not flexible, that are not proactive, and that are not re ready to expand and be what, what we at Altimeter call uh, dynamic organizations, to take on the needs of their users and take on their next challenges and remain competitive. On the other hand, 55% of the outperforming global firms embrace openness and collaboration. And you may look at this and say, well, okay, openness and collaboration is all well and good, but there's very different definitions of what that means inside of different organizations for different tasks and among different organizational uh, leaders. And that's true. But I want you to keep this in mind, this idea of openness and collaboration, having this be a collaborative process as you take on a mobile control strategy versus a top-down uh, preference force for the organization. One of the ways that this manifests itself is we've heard so much about BYOD. We've heard so much about users bringing their devices in. Well, we have to do it, right? We've got more than 50% of users with smartphones, and there's tablets, and users are taking these devices with them every single day. Well, guess what? Recent data points to the fact that only 9% of the businesses that have gone out and, and opened the doors to BYOD have been able to actually cut their expenditures. That's a huge problem because now you're looking at not only a, 
a cacophony of different choices, IT running around trying to react to all these different platforms and applications, but you're actually spending money. 91% of these companies didn't find savings. That means to me they actually kept or even increased what they were spending as they welcomed in BYOD. And that's a natural side effect of taking this on in a reactive way versus a proactive way. Um, the flip side of this, 17% do feel that it improves productivity and 15% see it as a cost-cutting tactic, but then again is that delta. Those 15% that saw it as a cost-cutting tactic, unfortunately, a good 6% of them definitely didn't actually cut costs. 19% do it to keep employees happy. We hear a lot about retention, recruiting of that, that uh, young age demographic, uh, among which 70% are gravitating to smartphones. It's a pretty expensive investment to make for recruitment if there's no way to scale this investment, track this investment, and have visibility in a way that makes it actually pay out for the organization. So how do we do it? It's, first of all, not an all or nothing. Uh, there are growing levels of risk mitigation that match growing levels of user empowerment. And there's nothing wrong with being at the one-star level versus the three-star level. And in just a minute, we're going to actually get a little bit of input from you as to where your organizations are. But at the bottom level, basic access is OK. We talked about those information workers who are looking to consume information in a relatively static fashion. Uh, basic access really is email being pushed to devices along with other calendar contacts, uh, basic data. And the devices themselves are managed. This could be as simple as using the 27 or so active sync policies that are native inside of your Microsoft Exchange server, letting users do self-service to provision devices. It's a relatively easy way to mitigate risk and give users some access, but the user empowerment is also pretty basic. As you move up the stack, you start thinking about things like off-the-shelf applications. People are gravitating to Dropbox. What is the implementation of that tool or another similar tool that can actually empower some of those, say, field and service workers that are looking to collaborate. Obviously, more controls need to be in place. The device data needs to be, first of all, visible to the IT and the management of the organization. Uh, identity from something like an Active Directory server needs to extend to mobile so that there is one persona being managed across the mobile device as it would be on a desktop. And that helps to mitigate risk. And that's where a lot of organizations are struggling to get to today. And that's really where this idea of a mobile control plane starts to make sense. We're not talking about simple mobile device management. We're talking about mobile user empowerment. The top level for three stars, I think, is mostly aspirational for the firms that I've talked to in my research, where users have role-based applications that are deployed across the different roles and personas in the organization. Uh, dynamic policy is in place for devices where uh, something like geofencing may be in place for a high compliance organization where my iPad actually loses one or two applications temporarily when I walk off the corporate campus. Data security user management is uh, flowing through not just the user and the device but in unison with the user and the mobile device, their desktop, perhaps even uh, M2M enabled facilities management and physical security. This is sort of the completely unified view of the user across any device where the network can anticipate the user's needs, scale to that user, and respond, route traffic, and route policy. I say it's a bit of a panacea because most organizations simply don't have the technological footprint in place, but building at that one and two star level with a flexible infrastructure that provides visibility is the first step to getting there and enabling that, which will be the place most organizations want to go in the very near future. So we're going to put up another poll question. And we want to ask you, what does management look like inside of your organization? And uh, we'll give you a few, few minutes to think about this. Uh, what is it that uh, your organization is doing right now? And of course, again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, we simply want to get a sense from you about what your organization is doing. So while uh, Justin runs the poll, we'll give you folks a couple minutes to uh, fill that in. Take the pause to actually remind you again that uh, Q&A is uh, open and available on the uh, question area of your GoToMeeting player. You can also simply use the chat. Um, we have uh, folks standing by for all manner of questions, uh, looking to get input and questions on the content from you. But if you have any technical questions, we have folks to answer those as well. And I haven't checked, obviously, but if Twitter's back up and running, keep in mind that we have our hashtag is hash mobile two period zero. 
hash mobile 2.0. So Justin, how are we looking on the poll? Good. We have, um, I think we're just about at a quorum here. So we'll go ahead and close this up and display the results for everybody. Great. So it's like 44% uh, still determining their needs, 6% have control of their data and their devices on one platform, 31% have it on multiple platforms, nobody has a response to policy in place to manage any platforms, and almost a fifth of them don't know. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, Justin, and thanks everybody for participating. I think that 44% to me is quite telling. Still trying to make a decision, we're obviously having the right conversation today. Um, and I think it's actually right that not many, if, if, if any, organizations are in that truly dynamic, responsive, cross the board, any device, any time policy. Uh, and nor would I expect anybody to necessarily be there as we're still in the early days. And, and that's what I wanted to talk about next. So we think about this market. And I talked earlier about how there's so many entrants. We've got uh, mobile device managers, mobile application managers, mobile enter enterprise managers, and there's a lot of confusion out there, rightly so, in the market around what are the tools that need to be taken in. And I think, unfortunately, uh, a great technology, a foundational technology of this, mobile device management, has gotten a bit of a bad rap. Uh, this makes me think a lot uh, back to in the 2008 to 2010 timeframe when the word virtualization and cloud seemed to be plastered on everything, including children's toys. So uh, here we are with MDM. What exactly does it mean? Um, the way that I define MDM and when we talk about the control plane is that idea of de de managing the device, making sure the device is secure, remote lock, remote wipe, uh, the ability to uh, have some visibility into what devices are being used, what devices aren't. But True mobile management actually goes quite a bit beyond that. And the market itself is trying to figure out what the proper term, the magic silver bullet is to obviously sell solutions. And uh, it's created a bit of confusion. We've started to really define what real mobile return is. And that's not just managing the device, but it's managing the device, it's managing users, it's managing service, and it's managing the overall policy and governance infrastructure. So I see us at this point where we're kind of coming out of the noisy bit of market where uh, all manner of new entrants are coming in, companies and vendors that you've never heard of with dubious products and questionable claims. We're moving into a point of consolidation, and consolidation actually happens in two ways. Number one, we see obviously larger uh, enterprise software vendors, system software uh, uh, vendors getting into this market and trying to uh, offer wares that uh, work into their larger dashboards. And for some organizations, large organizations, some medium organizations, that's the direction they'd like to go. They want to keep their complexity low. But given the fact that we have so many different device types and device platforms today, many still and actually more are choosing for best of breed products. Well, there's good news there for consolidation as well because these products are starting to expand. We're starting to see fewer and fewer standalone players simply looking at enterprise app stores, simply looking at uh, device management, and certainly simply looking at uh, a single type of device management like uh, the RIM BlackBerry, that model has gone as well with even RIM themselves offering a multi-platform mobile device management tool. So we're starting to see these solutions mesh together, and they're starting to mesh together to create a out-of-the-box mobile control plane that organizations can take and use from a technology standpoint. But it's not just about technology, it's actually about governance and technology. So when we talk about the mobile control plane, this is how it looks. We've got two sides of this. The sort of soft skill side, as I mentioned before, with governance, legal and risk, technology leadership, what platforms are we going to choose? How are we going to design our policies? Uh, what does the content strategy look like? What can and can't leave the organization? And how is my data segmented and, and accounted for? Uh, as well as ongoing training. How do we use these devices responsibly? How do we use the tools that are being rolled out? And that flows into education as well. This is where the security team, the IT team are working together, and they're bringing in input from HR, legal, uh, in the uh, organizations that have it, a chief risk officer or CISO, a chief information security officer, to set the tone for how mobile will be managed inside the organization. All of that input then manifests itself in a unified stack of technology that takes into account more than just the device. 
we've got the basic uh, capabilities like PIMSYNC, that idea that you can hook into email, contacts, calendaring. We've got mobile device management, show me where my device is, help me lock or wipe the device if it's lost. But we go a step further as we start thinking about applications, either built in-house or brought in from off-the-shelf providers. How do we manage those applications? How do we take on the life cycle of those applications to ensure that they're getting to the devices and users they need to from the word go, managed, patched, updated, and ultimately retired if needed? How do we deal with the data security of information that resides inside those apps? It gets a lot more complicated as we move up that stack of user enablement when data starts to reside in places other than simply email. It starts to uh, have interactions with the cloud, interactions with other application servers. How do we ensure that that information is sandboxed, secured, and how do we apply different layers of policy to different uh, elements of the uh, device and different elements of data subject to the policies we've defined in governance? Uh, and lastly, and probably most importantly, service management. How do we know what the users are doing? How do we know that they're able to do what they can well? A field service worker is only as productive as their device allows for connectivity, performance of the application, access to the data in a way that keeps them on the move. And by the way, this continues on. This is an amorphous bit of technology because it ties into other systems, uh, DLP or, or information protection, making sure that those policies are brought in and enforced by the mobile management tool that's in place. Network access control. I feel like we've been saying for five or ten years that NAC is dead. Well, NAC is definitely alive and well today. And access control for the network ties into identity and authorization and device management to ensure that when we light up these mobile devices, we don't fall into that 91% of organizations that found no savings or spent more because it blows up our wireless LAN or our VPN. It actually scales to meet the needs of those devices as they come online. And lastly, systems management. The larger systems management picture absolutely has to take on mobile. We're well past the point where mobile sits on its own, monitored and, and managed by one standalone piece of, of software or technology. We're at a point where we need a mobile control plane that takes all of this into account. So just to recap, and I won't walk through each one of these, when we think about control, there's the governance piece of it that deals with policy and ownership, and this can really mean a change in the structure of the organization and how the organization takes on mobile devices. And then on the uh, technology side, there's actually quite a few moving parts here. Now I want to stress that many organizations, depending on that user enablement stack and how far up the stack they are or are planning to go, may need all or may need only a portion of these technologies. Many organizations may find that their user base is 100% information workers and simple static information management makes sense. Tying into an enterprise content management makes sense. It's still wise, of course, to have an eye into the uptime monitoring of these devices, the utilization of these devices, and the overall picture of what these devices are being used for, both inside and outside the workplace, so that we're not opening ourselves up to any additional risk. But uh, it is a different mix of technologies put together for any different organization, depending on what they're looking to accomplish. The point here is that it is a mix of technologies and not a simple band-aid, silver bullet, or plug that can be put into the organization to solve mobile management. And that is really the myth of what many things purporting to be, quote, MDM, are offering today. No simple solution will solve this problem. You need to enable the ability to have flexible policies, visibility to devices, uh, and overall risk mitigation. If you look at mobile as a purely IT issue, this is another trap that we see a lot of organizations fall into. It's a bit of outdated thinking. That whole governance side in many organizations is either left as an afterthought or perhaps not involved in the conversation at all. And that causes a lot of problems where the policy isn't applied properly or the risk mitigation simply doesn't scale. So involving that other side of governance appointing leadership, mobile strategy inside the organization that has hooks into HR and legal uh, is really, really important. And as I mentioned, many, many more moving parts. And again, I don't intend for the mobile control plane to overwhelm. Rather, I'd like you to think about it as a new holistic way of thinking about what managing mobile should look like versus what in many uh, uh, corporations it does look like to say. So let's get into recommendations, and uh, we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour here, so any questions that you have, please do put them into the Q&A or the chat, and we'll uh, go through those 
as we uh, round out here. But I just want to recap sort of where we are today. Really, the steps to take on a mobile strategy, it begins with a business driver. What is the pain that you're looking to address? What's in place today? In many organizations, the simple visibility into what users are bringing in and what the organization is paying for is not there. You may find that your entire organization is equipped with feature phones that are ringing up bills for uh, on-deck carrier applications that would never be allowed on a PC and would never be allowed if you had the visibility into it. Take stock of what's in place now using a tool that gives you visibility to move forward and understand what the cost and user impact is today and what it will be as you light up mobile users in the future. It's then time to think about go governance. Where does ownership lie today? Is it a purely IT problem? And if so, how do we either take a center of excellence within IT and create hooks into other areas, developing those policies in tandem with HR, IT, legal, all involved and all at the table. The related groups really needs to take place at launch if possible, uh, and measurement is key. How effectively can we enforce the HR policies? How effectively can we enforce fair use? How effectively can we enforce compliance? Uh, in many cases, the answers may surprise you, and it may be simply impossible to accomplish certain things. That will determine the technology that is chosen and the journey that you take with mobile. There are some apps and some verticals and some types of organizations that simply aren't possible due to the risk they pose. But having visibility will answer those questions for you. I've talked a lot about MDM, and I do believe that mobile device management in its truest sense, the ability to manage the device, see the device, and, and act on the device, is a backbone from which you can scale. Um, you'll have to determine what that level of mis risk mitigation and user enablement is that suits your industry, your organization, and your leadership structure. Um, and it will probably vary quite a bit from role to role, depending on the personas that make up your organization. You have to avoid the one-size-fits-all solution, uh, the ability to have a sliding scale and ultimately have policies that adapt to and even recognize a user based on identity or credentials and apply policies dynamically. That's the goal of where we want to go. Because once all of this is in place, you really then have the ability to create a mobile workforce and continually refine and customize what those role requirements are. What's that? next application or that next tool I can roll out to my executives or my field service reps to give them that little bit of edge that makes them a bit more productive. Um, maintaining an open dialogue and, and exploring what those roles need on the job and doing ride-alongs is extremely important. These are tools that for many roles determine the ability to do or not be able to do their jobs and taking a, a very serious look at how effective the tools are and moving to replace or update them when they're not is a critical component of this. And you assess the uh, functionalities that you'll need to add based on a persona in a persona-based way. And um, at the end of this, I'll, I'll give you a, a pointer to our next webinar, which is actually going to get into how do you build the mobile workforce. Presuming all of this mobile control plan is in place, you've got the building blocks either in place or coming in place, how do you then go ahead and actually start thinking about what it is that that executive needs versus the salesperson, the information worker versus the IT worker. They're very different th things, and there's many different tools that you can bring on board and even ways that the control plane can help you roll those technologies and capabilities out, but you need to build the control plane first. So just to recap, building for flexibility, it really depends and starts with a solid business case and a vision of what's happening today, what the impact will be of what you choose tomorrow. There will be some streamlining in the, in the solutions we see in market. We're seeing a lot of... Uh, we're seeing a lot of harmony start to take place between the device management, the application management, the user management, and then beyond. Much better hooks and APIs come into the market from large software vendors that do things like DLP and uh, take on things like encryption, identity management, and even systems management as well. Um, but the requirements, policy, requirements gathering, rather, the policy and, and role determination needs to be the basis for architecture decisions. You need to think about this as a governance-led architecture initiative that precedes a technology purchase or adoption. And it's going to take some time to build it. It will grow as complexity does. You may not have uh, any need for uh, custom applications with highly sensitive data in them today. And as a result, you may not need to find that plug-in for uh, mobile device application encryption or application data encryption. But those needs will come, and having a roadmap that anticipates the next steps you take for each of your roles will help guide you toward 
what are the right choices to plug into your mobile control plane. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, it's actually a great analogy for, for those of us that have spent our time in IT. When you think about this mobile control plane, think of it as a chassis. Think of it as a foundational block of technology that allows for basic input output management of that device that you can then layer on top different policies, different tools, different capabilities as your users need them. If you think about your mobile control plane as that chassis with the ability to build onto it, you'll be looking by definition at the right extensible solutions that are actually going to let you proactively anticipate your, your mobile users' needs and scale to support those small mobile users. So again, I want to call your attention, August 23rd, 10 a.m. Pacific, we'll be following this up talking about how does an organization, once all of this is in place and starting to be developed, take on the ability to uh, enable mobile workers. What do those workers look like? What is the mix of tools? Who is that mobile strategist and where do they come from that helps make all of this a reality? So the link here is live. You can also copy the link into your browser. That will take you to the registration page. We really hope that you'll join us to continue the conversation. Um, I'll pause here. We have a few minutes left. And uh, on my end, I'm, I'm actually not seeing uh, the question uh, the question console. So Justin, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, any questions coming up? There, there's one or two here in my chat that I can defer to. We do have a couple. Um, Barbara Frontera asks what your thoughts are about the impact that carriers, mobile broad carriers slash mobile broadband providers have on the system. Can they keep up with usage? Will they come up with ever more complex pricing policies? <laughs> um, I think, unfortunately, knowing carriers, the latter is probably true. Um, but I think those Byzantine pricing policies will start to uh, actually represent a greater amount of value. So we're seeing a lot of carriers. Uh, in, 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 the, in the void that existed and still to some degree exists today of unifying these multiple different pieces of the solution, carriers have emerged to bring these solutions together, package them up, and provide a bit of control plane to, to organizations. Um, and, and as is often the case with a services-led approach, I see sort of a reverse uh, parabola here. So we've got a lot of interest in the mid-market for outsourcing this to the carrier although the very small will tend to either build it themselves or take it on as a cloud-based service from uh, small vendors, and the very large, of course, take it on in-house. So carriers are definitely helping to uh, provide some of the glue to bring this mobile control plane together. Um, all we need them to do now is simplify how they itemize that in our extremely long and paper-killing, uh, tree-killing bills, rather. Thanks. We got another one. Uh, what, in your opinion, is holding companies back from deploying a more strategic and whole approach like you're proposing? Yeah, that, that's interesting. There's sort of two paths that I think IT in general, and especially IT when it refers to mobile, can take. Um, and it, it, they sort of go toward two IT personas. You've got the hero persona and the, uh, you know, the, the golf course or vacation persona. And many IT organizations, by dint of uh, being understaffed, underfunded, or simply overburdened with multiple different projects in place. We've just come out of a bit of a tech spending recession over the past two years. There's a lot on the plate of the IT department. And they're constantly running around trying to be the hero, trying to put out fires. Taking that approach to mobile uh, really quickly uh, makes the organization almost impossible to scale. So you see these organizations grasping for control, barring platforms, uh, restricting usage, because it's simply the only way they can get their hands around it. And uh, that uh, level of service only gets worse as more devices, more users with devices come on the network. The other path, and, and I think you can choose which of these is probably the right one to be on, is the golf course or the uh, vacation persona. And this is the CIO or the head of IT that you know is, the, is the, the guy or gal that virtualized all their servers five years ago and consolidated their storage and has everything on elastic demand. Uh, taking on technologies that grow with demand, taking on technologies that grow with need in the in the case of mobile, having a unified infrastructure for policy enforcement, device management, and application management, these folks are on a golf course or on a beach looking at the numbers tick up and saying, wow, I'm really glad I got ahead of this and solved the problem ahead of time. So it, it, it sounds a bit contrite, but we do really see that dichotomy between how IT organizations take this on. And uh, it's never too late to try and get off of that hero path and onto that uh, CIO and the golf course path, it's simply a matter of buying for not just now, but buying for the future, accounting for not just the platforms you have today, but 
the multiple platforms you may have tomorrow. Uh, very early on, I showed that slide where there's a very small sliver at the top in terms of platform adoption that's simply labeled other. That other group is only getting bigger. We're seeing Amazon come into the market with a smartphone. We're seeing uh, Apple rumored to launch different versions of their iPad, the Google Nexus 7 tablet, uh, rocketing past likely the Amazon Kindle Fire in terms of the most preferred tablet device for consumers and then those consumers bringing it to work. This uh, management problem only gets more complicated and being able to uh, build a holistic infrastructure that anticipates change versus controls uh, uh, controls change is, is quite important. Well, I think we got time for one more question. Um, Alan is asking, how many platforms are we ultimately headed towards? Two? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think right now uh, it's fair to say that we're, we're looking at three to maybe four platforms. Uh, we will see some uh, variant of Linux come in to uh, enable lower cost smartphones, and we're starting to see here talk about that, whether it's a, a fork of the Android uh, OS or something different from Amazon. Uh, those devices are likely not going to be a huge concern for the enterprise. They're also likely not going to be a huge concern in North America. But in North America, we still have iOS and Android for sure. Uh, we have BlackBerry 10. Many organizations have a consistent uh, commitment to the BlackBerry ecosystem and will be looking to it at the very least trial uh, some of that BlackBerry 10 uh, infrastructure if it does make its way to market. Uh, probably as important, if not more important than that, is what happens with both Windows Phone today, Mango and its future variants, Windows Phone 7, but also Windows 8, because then we'll have an operating system that really starts to blur the line between desktop, tablet, and smartphone, and we'll need to get smart quite quickly around how that uh, ecosystem looks, how we manage those devices, and keep an eye out for those holistic providers that have an edge on managing those Windows 8 devices as they come to market. Uh, refreshes, I know, on the desktop side are probably two, three years out based on past uh, trends, but uh, refreshes on the consumer and mobile hardware are much quicker. So uh, that technology will be making its way in quite quickly. So uh, I guess my answer there is probably three, three and a half uh, platforms at the minimum is what we're looking at for the next uh, two to three years. Okay, well, that looks like about all the time we have today. Uh, thank you very, very much, Chris, for joining us. Um, I encourage everyone still on the line to visit us at visagemobile.com, put your head around, um, check out some of the things we're doing. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, very much. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. My pleasure. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. All right. Bye-bye.